Order, would you please call the roll? Thank you, uh, Board Member Corsi. I'm here. Board Member Gonzalez. Here. Board Member Judy. Here. Board Member Rabbit. Board Member Roger. Here. Vice Chair Petro. Absolutely. And Chair Fleming. I'm sorry, Vice Chair Petro. Here. Chair Fleming, if that's it. <laughs> I let the record reflect that all board members are present with the exception of uh, board member Rabbit and uh, Chair Fleming. Great. Let's move on to the approval of the minutes. Are there any changes to the minutes? Are there any public comments on the minutes? None needed. None needed? Yeah, okay. So the uh, minutes are adopted as, uh, as presented. Item three is public comments on non-agenda matters. There are some members of the public, I think, uh, connected. And uh, if so, um, um, if you wish to uh, make a comment, let the reporting secretary know. Accept comment via Zoom. Oh, policy, policy change. Desirable policy change, okay. Uh, so there are no members of the public here, so there's no public comment. Uh, let's go on then to item uh, 4.1, policy discussion, uh, Gabe Osborne. Good afternoon, Vice Chair and members of the board, Gabe Osborne, Director of Planning and Economic Development. Uh, bear with me for a moment while I pull up the presentation. Okay, well, thank you for joining us today. Um, we will touch on three main points within this one agenda item. And as we've performed in similar board meetings, uh, Vice Chair would be happy to facilitate this as an open conversation. If questions come up as we go through this, uh, feel free to bring those up. Um, I will pause in certain areas in the presentation as we move forward into different topics. Our goal today really is to provide a summary of what we have been working on as staff since our last meeting. Do that in the first slide. Uh, we'll also talk quite a bit about the project list. And uh, we, we went over that in depth in the last meeting. Um, some of what I discussed will be a bit duplicative to that conversation as a reminder. Um, but we'll also talk about another strategy that can focus on large project development downtown and how that could potentially be incorporated in the IFP. Um, and then we'll also talk about timeline and, and what it means as far as future meetings go and, and go over some of the major steps that we have discussed in other meetings, but just give a really good idea of where we need to be by what date, to meet what tax base year. So our first slide, we'll talk a bit about what we have been working on. Um, there's been a lot of conversation uh, internally with the city and with the city and the county on coming to an agreement or finding out a way to come to an agreement on the main components of the IFP. And that really is the project list and the, the commitment on tax percentage. Uh, so we held meetings in December 8th of 2023, February 8th of this year, and February 26th of this year. Uh, we also received a request from the county to participate in a board of supervisors meeting on April 30th, which will focus on this topic. Uh, during that time, we've also been working on the IFP. Um, as, as we mentioned in previous meetings, the, the two main moving parts, the project list and the tax percentage are fairly critical to getting to where we can present a draft IFP to the public. And then that kickstarts the formal process of getting us through the adoption. Uh, so to put placeholders in that document, we have started with a few different cash flow model um, theories at 50% for both the city and the county, also 75. Um, once again, these are placeholders just to develop some numbers to get the document closer to the finish line. Um, we've also addressed um, some project based on what we discussed in the last meeting. We have some draft project lists that I'll talk a little bit about that are a good starting point for that conversation. Some of the feedback that we received through the, our, our communication with the county was how do we deal with the redevelopment agency parcels that are currently in the EIFD boundary? And there was some feedback provided to our consultant team. Um, and I'll hand it over to Lenny here in a minute to talk through that. Um, and really what we wanted to develop is get to where we have a really solid initial draft of the IFP. Won't go public until the other pieces are addressed, but we're reducing the amount of time once those decisions are made to where we can get that going down the formal process. 
Um, and so with that, I will actually hand it over to Lenny from DTA and Lenny will describe uh, some of the steps that she has been going through over the last few months. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Yes, Lenny, can you please can you please give um, the your firm's lit name, the acronym DTA? Sure, David Tossigan Associates. Uh, we are a DBA um, of David Tossigan Associates, and we've shortened our name and we market it as DTA. So we are the fiscal uh, and the EIFD number crunchers, if you will. So as we have been going through the process of identifying. What needs to be done? We've prepared a draft or a shell of the IFP. It basically outlines what we're going to be discussing in the IFP, but it doesn't have numbers yet. And those numbers are contingent upon the percentages that both the city and the county will be allocating to this district. So for um, our last meeting, and I apologize, I wanted to have it prepared for today, but I have a, a problem and an error in my computer and I'm trying to figure it out. Um, otherwise, I wanted to present the numbers again. The numbers will not change. The RDA, pulling the RDA out and the um, non-RDA parcels, the dollar amounts, the cumulative bond proceeds and pay as you go will be the same, but it will be displayed in a different manner so that you can see what is specifically against the RDA property and what is against the non-RDA property. And with that, I will get a completion before the end of the week um, and be able to provide um, the city with some of that information, which they can determine it's appropriate to forward onto the PFA. Uh, once that the numbers are chosen and we elect the uh, applicable percentages for each of the agencies, we will finalize those numbers. And then those numbers are used to put into the IFP. Prior to it, the IFP being in, in, a, in a final draft form, we will review with Chris Lynch and Bob Gable and Gamble, excuse me, to uh, just make sure that all of the parameters of everything that we wanted to cover in the IFP is, is will be covered. So that's about where we are right now. I expect, like I said, to have numbers before the end of the week because I'm in the crux of trying to figure out my model and why there's an error. And uh, we'll be providing that to the city shortly. Okay, um, and that's a very brief overview of the IFP, and I think we can pause. Is there any specific questions about that document, um, the steps that we need to go through moving forward, or anything that we've done to date? Any questions? Sorry. Yeah, okay. yeah. Just, I have a question on the RDA, and the, um, if somebody could sort of refresh my memory on uh, doesn't the revenue and existing RDA flow to the successor agency? And then, I mean, so how, if I understood what she was just saying, she was saying pulling the RDA parcels out doesn't affect the base. And I'm not, I'm not sure I understood that correctly. Lenny, would you like to provide a response to that question? Sure, and I'll invite Bob to chime in as well. Um, what we know is that the RDA current property is being met. The um, the their obligation is currently being paid. Therefore, anything above and beyond that is available to go towards the EIFD. Okay. To secure the debt, we would not sell uh, senior lien bonds, which are at a higher level than junior lien bonds to protect the RDA's property. But we still are utilizing the same numbers in order to calculate what a junior or senior lien bond would look like. Okay. Chair, any other questions? No, I was actually going to make the observation that we'd been previously told that the existing tax income was fully servicing mm -hmm. the RDA debt and therefore uh, would not affect tax increment in the future. Mm -hmm. and that it does affect the bonding priority. Yeah. That's correct. Okay, so the, the next component that we'll talk about um, is, is the one many people want to talk about because it's the end goal of what we're trying to do is build out these projects. And what we discussed in the last meeting were a few different categories, and I'll, I'll go over those briefly. And we were looking for projects that focused on beautification, activation of public space, um, but the big linchpin or catalyst project that would make a difference downtown, specifically with connectivity between Railroad Square and Courthouse Square. 
And that connectivity really focused on two components. Um, the first was working with existing configurations. Um, mainly we have Simon Mall. Uh, Simon is not at the table, is not part of this process. So having the EIFD invest in something that may not materialize ever potentially is something that we would need to build a contingency plan around. And we'll talk about that in future slides. So we looked at some things that we could do within the existing configurations. Uh, that's really working with the underpass. So we had talked about lighting projects, murals, um, making it a more desirable location to be air purification, wayfinding, raised walkways, um, to beautify that corridor in some way, shape or form. And a really rough price estimate that we put to that was eight to 10 million to, to facilitate that type of project. And this was just a brief example provided of some of the underpass lighting that, that provides that aesthetic benefit. The other component with the Third Street alignment fell into a redevelopment bucket. So in the event that Third Street is reimagined through private development that occurs on the Simon Mall, um, how could we invest in a better corridor through that area? So the concept of raising that to grade, uh, building out that roadway, increasing bike and pedestrian connectivity through that corridor, still providing some of the beautification elements through landscaping and wayfinding and art are all a possibility, but it likely requires the overhanging piece to be removed, which requires the participation outside. The other areas that we looked at are some of our unused public space in the downtown core. Uh, there was a discussion about Comstock Mall, which is very close to this building, and what can we do to activate that space? Um, we discussed this as being either something that is initiated through the city, the city controls that space and can initiate a project in that area, or something that is coordinated with adjacent uh, private development. Uh, we discussed lighting, landscaping, public art. Uh, there was topics discussed about recreational options that we can do there as well. So it was reprogramming that space and, and that had a preliminary cost of five to 10 million. Um, then we had a variety of different additional options that once again, focus on areas that the city can control. That's the existing public right of way or land that the city owns. So that gets into general landscaping and lighting improvements. Uh, we talked about public parklets and generally the cost is 40 to 50 per um, we also talked about public art and we talked about sidewalk bulb, out, bulb outs that would potentially provide more public space that could be activated. And at the last meeting, there was also a discussion about including a concept to be able to provide support for housing in, in that district. So now if we look at that, what that does is it puts a project list together that has very general dollar amounts to it in very general categories that, that cover all of those elements. And these numbers can move around, they can shift as far as the distribution of that total dollar amount. But what it's attempting to achieve is the total revenue of 45 million in that district for that period of time. And as you can see that we have the check boxes there for the different categories. So three of these fall on city property. As we discussed, the connectivity may actually require some private investment. And then if you look at affordable housing, since that requires a private developer to build, this would be a contribution to that in some way, shape or form. That becomes a private element as well because you need that, that public private partnership to make that work. So now what we've been discussing for the last few months, um, and I think many of you are aware that there have been conversations downtown about the possibility of larger conference or entertainment centers. Um, uh, Sonoma County Tourism is working on a feasibility study that's looking at the placement of that type of use in the downtown area. And if we look at how the EFD could potentially fund something like that was the strategy that we've been working out for the last two months. So really what would that, that would look like is that it would be likely if we put a conference center downtown to occur on private property, specifically if it's a focus on the mall, but if other private properties are looked at, it could just follow that same model somewhere else. Um, also, in this particular case, the total construction cost is a bit unknown. That feasibility study will have to look at the next phase and understand what it would take to build something like that. But if we factor this into our project list, what we can do is go with a bit of a priority model. And what that would look like, it would, it would basically create a priority one project, which is the large development on private property center that we think provides the best benefit for downtown. It can throw the full dollar amount to it. And it would be in a wait and see mode until that project started materializing over the life of EFD. Now, the challenge that it creates is there has to be an avenue that if that never materializes, how does the revenue get spent? So it develops a priority two project list. And in the priority two project list, you see that there are projects that predominantly can be done on city controlled land. 
So money can then be invested in those as we move forward. And as we flesh this out, it's important to note you can do both. So there is the possibility of basically just waiting to see if the convention center or the entertainment center comes into play. And then you can start, if it doesn't, to take some of that revenue and move it towards the other projects, but still hold some of that revenue back for the bigger conference center. What it would look like when that pivot occurs is that likely would be both a county and a city decision to make that pivot. So the investment in the IFP really would be in the conference center and the city and the county would have to make a determination that based on the fact that that was not moving over some course of time through the EIFD, that the expenditure should then be redirected to a contingency list. Um, it would not necessarily be changing that contingency list. All these project types will be baked into the IFP. So the direction then to the PFA is that the PFA is then empowered to start moving money towards that contingency list. Does there have to be a, a, an official commitment towards a, a, an amount of time or is that more flexible and can be done sort of behind the scenes as circumstances change? It can be done behind the scenes as circumstances change. So the language would likely be embedded in the IFP. Um, we'll still have to work through that concept if, if this is the direction that could be supported both the city and the county level as far as the project list goes. Uh, but that would not necessarily have any time commitment to say 10 years you have to make a decision. Um, at some point, the funds do need to be spent, but even at the back end of the life of the EIFD, there's still the possibility of spending that total dollar amount through your priority two list. And I think that that's an important piece, and that's really why the dollar amounts have to match. Um, but I think what's also important about this is that affordable housing elevates up. That can be included in the priority one list as well. Some of these elements can be pulled up and still be priority one projects, and then your contingency list are all of those that may still provide a benefit, but not the same benefit that the conference center does or affordable housing or whatever is the ultimate decision of the board of supervisors and the city council for that project list. So I'll pause there. Um, I think this is an important piece because this really changes the direction of uh, the IFP to some extent. And it is one of the critical elements that we are trying to address at this point is an agreement on this list. Um, the dollar amounts can change as part of this process. As Lenny mentioned, these go into the model. So it's the tax percentage plus whatever the project list is or, or really two of the main components in the mathematical calculation behind the scenes. So that can fluctuate with time. Um, but just understanding the priority concept and then understanding really what is the project that we can rally around. And I know the PFA is critical to that but also the city and the county are even more critical to that because the reality is the way the process works before it ever goes to the PFA for adoption, the city or the county have to bless the IFP. Um, so, and I think with a conference center or an entertainment center, especially with a feasibility study going in the mix, it's a little easier to understand because of the effort that's going into that feasibility study, what the economic development is on the back end of that. There's a formal study around those types of uses and you can see what the return on the investment is. Director Osborne, uh, recognizing that Chair Rabbit has joined us and he came in about midway through this slide. Um, can you do a quick recap and lead in to this slide? Absolutely. <laughs> and I apologize. Oh, it's a, you left a little earlier than I did on the memorial no, I, service. Oh, we do it here? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Liver in Sonoma. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, so, Supervisor Rabbit, I, I don't believe you were at the last meeting when we discussed the, the preliminary project list that we went over in the, the few slides, but um, some of the projects that we have been focusing on are projects the city can implement in the existing public right-of-way that don't require a private benefit. And the reason for that is because there is a guaranteed way to spend that revenue through the EIFD. Uh, but we also went with a bit of a combo approach in that because we talked about if our main catalyst project is to create connectivity between railroad square and courthouse square that that could potentially take two forms it could take beautifying the existing underpass in a variety of different ways but also if simon was ever interested in developing that there may be a public private partnership availability to where we can raise the third street to grade we can improve that corridor sidewalks by connectivity beautification through art and landscaping so that injected this process of the EIFD really can go after these bigger private development projects and wait until they come into the mix and build up that revenue through that time. Or it can start investing in projects that as soon as that revenue is there can be completed because the full control exists. 
So the important point we wanted to make here is that because I think there is a desire to have it be a game changer downtown, and this is potentially an avenue to do that, then how do we rally around that bigger project? And the bigger project being either the connectivity issues between Railroad Square and Courthouse Square, or a conference center, or an entertainment center, to have the EIFD tee that up and be ready to fund that. And it potentially can fund a significant amount. And this, this could, we're not talking about small gap funding in this particular case, if you focus on a singular project. Um, so our attempt was to really pivot it to that priority conversation um, to see if we can really get buy-in on those priority projects. And then of course the priority two is also, if we, we can't spend the money, that really becomes then our contingency list that we would have to move to. Um, and I can't recall if you walked in when we discussed how we would go through that list, but just a quick reminder, it would be the Board of Supervisors and the City Council to make the decision to move away from priority one and start expenditures in priority two. Great, thank you, appreciate that. Are there questions for Gabe or for anyone else here from the city? Um, some of these questions, uh, a couple of these questions that I have are probably more important for the April 30th workshop than they are right now, but, but I'll ask them now and maybe we can just put a pen in them for that. Um, when we discussed this at the Board of Supervisors um, the last time we did discuss this, I think that there was um, a question and kind of a void of information about the nexus between some of the projects that we talked about, um, like Comstock Mall, Third Street, and how that is creating, spurring the, the tax increment that we're, that we're looking at. So I think it, a, 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 a brief explanation of that at the workshop would be very important. Also, um, you mentioned the, uh, Looking at 50% and, and 75% uh, on both the city and the county side of, of the increment going toward these projects. Uh, total numbers and, and how that looks. And, and I think we looked at that, at least we did at the red. So I imagine you, you were too last year, or maybe even the year before. It's been, it's been a while. But going through some of, of that with, with the Board of Supervisors would be helpful as well. Um, I wanted to ask about the $3 million for affordable housing um, out of a total 45. Um, that's a relatively low number. What is that, 5 or 6%, something like that? And how that was arrived at. And uh, if we ought to look at more of a range with, with a bigger number. And I can answer that question. So, what we had looked at initially with affordable housing. Um, and we can go either way with this. Uh, so that number can increase, I think is the important point out of this. Um, but what we were looking at are certain things initially with that project list that once again, we control. So we were looking at affordable housing building downtown and what would the public infrastructure cost be of affordable housing and how do you support that through public infrastructure, which that usually is not the most significant cost of affordable housing. Um, the EIFD is not restricted to basically just providing affordable housing. So I think as we go through this, some of the feedback that we're really looking for to form up this list is exactly that. So if we wanted to say, and I think hopefully what we can do by the 30th, which we'll, we'll get it close to this without finalizing the IFP because we can't go to that next step, um, but just understanding the mathematics of if you're trying to target a certain dollar amount, call it 45 million, where does your tax percentage need to be to do that? And then with these categories, if we generally agree that these are the categories, moving dollars amounts around becomes much easier and we can figure out what the appropriate percentage is. But that's all the feedback that we're really looking for at this point is that if this project list is generally good, what do we like about it? What do we not? How can we improve it? Um, that's all really great feedback. But to specifically answer your question, Supervisor, it was because it was focusing on public infrastructure, which generates a lower cost. Okay. Um, remind me, Gabe. Redevelopment, was that 20% dedicated to affordable housing? Ooh, I think it was. Yeah. Yeah. We can verify. Okay. That's what was yes, in my head yes, when I said was. that was a small it was. This is Chris Lynch from Jones Hall. It was a 20% affordable housing requirement. Okay. Thank you. Chris? 
Yeah. So one of the questions that I have around this move first for conference center or entertainment center, I know at least one of the potential sites that's been thrown around for a decade is out of the EIFD zone. And so at what point do you think we would have any type of clarity of when the feasibility study comes back, what our potential opportunities are, what's that timeline look like? Well, what we're hoping to work out now um, is that I think a good topic for the PFA would be to hear directly from Sonoma County Tourism on the feasibility study. Um, if this is the direction that it's moving to understand what that looks like, to hear some of the discussions about not necessarily the feasibility, but what's the game plan for construction. Um, one of our goals is to, to create an agenda item, and we'll talk a little bit about that when we get into our timelines, um, for the board to hear exactly from Sonoma County Tourism on those things. Okay. And then you mentioned right at the outset that Simon's not at the table for these discussions, but much of the project list, it, if it doesn't involve Simon, could be directly impacted by Simon. And what Simon ends up doing with the mall could potentially change the need to change Third Street. So should Simon be at the table? And Simon, the discussions with Simon are happening in a variety of different separate conversations. So yes, I think is a good answer to that. As we go through and we look at the feasibility of these projects and we understand these are the projects that we're looking to fund, then there does have to be a discussion with those private property owners that potentially would control this and to understand what that means to them. So, and especially if it's bringing cash into potentially a reimbursement on a project, does that change the model that they're looking forward to in the future. Um, so as far as the formal process, because of how this works being very heavy on the city and the county side and the PFA as a body, um, no. But then as far as the direction and understanding the logistics of what that would look like, I think definitely yes, because it, it helps us frame what implementation looks like long term. Uh, I think that's an important conversation to have. Uh, if you're just asking me, Third Street, is an okay connector between the square and railroad square if you can't get something that's between 4th and 7th, which seems to be the much more optimal for pedestrian and bicycle access. And so if we're investing big dollars in trying to make the area friendlier, but then there's a potential partnership with Simon that might allow it to be in a more optimal place, I'd rather know that sooner rather than later. Absolutely. And I think one of the, the purposes of keeping the list general uh, we focus on Third Street because we can control it, but keeping it in general allows connectivity to occur anywhere. Yeah. I have a, a question and an observation, but before coming to the chair, does anyone else have any, any questions first? I've also got one. Carol, thank you. Um, just the you know, board meeting in February, the county board meeting in February, um, you know, approved a sort of broad policy objectives and um, I'm just struggling a little bit with how the projects that are listed other than affordable housing align with some of the policy objectives that the board adopted and, you know, how you kind of resolve that. I mean, obviously the workshop will hopefully help to address some of those things in ongoing conversations, but particularly, I mean, can you kind of unpack how the conference center would um, potentially impact, you know, the strategic priorities, either affordable, affordable housing, no, uh, climate ad adaptation, resilience, transit oriented development, active transportation, or racial and social equity? I'm just, I'm, I'm not seeing the intersection. So we're still reviewing uh, the county's policy, uh, but our understanding is that the policy is more guidance. It, there was, if I speak for the supervisors, but there was an acknowledgement that obviously this process was already moving. Um, but I do believe that um, workforce development, economic development generally fits with the county's strategic priorities. So I do feel, even though that wasn't expressed in the, that language in the minimum requirement policy, it does reflect some level of county priority. But I am looking at the supervisors because I'm going to speak on behalf of the county. I don't have any argument with that. It, nor do I, uh, but um, 
So who would be the ultimate owner? And I've talked to Sonoma County Tourism a few times, and I look forward to continuing to see the business plan, the feasibility, and whether this thing really makes sense. Who would be the owner of a development such as that? I mean, I'm thinking, again, where's the property tax? There's no property tax increment right. with that development. Right. It has to be associated with the other development. For, for me, this is great, but tell me what, tell me what the, uh, the, next, the addendum would be of the property tax increments that would take place so that we would know how to make the financial decision at the county. Yeah, and I think those are all excellent questions. I think when we get in the initial phases of a project of this nature, I think many of us have the same questions about logistically, how is it going to be built? How are we going to fund it? Who is going to maintain it long term? And then really, what is the economic driver behind it? So understanding, are we talking about more sales tax dollars? Are we talking about triggering more housing, which generally a conference center wouldn't? Um, how do you make that economic finding more long term? which I think is the critical piece to any time we're diving in initially to some of those larger projects. Um, you know, I think if you look at housing and in, in much of the studies that we have done is that when you look at development of housing in that downtown core, that is increasing your tax increment. It's driving the property taxes up. Um, so what is the driver of people wanting to live downtown is one of the main pieces that we went through this before. So um, is it businesses? Is it you have more activation? Is it park space? Is it you have amenities like an entertainment center? Um, how do you balance between those two? But I think that's a, this is a critical piece. Um, and I think to some extent, a bit, the cart becomes before the horse uh, because you start understanding these conceptual ideas, but they're not fully vetted. And then it's a challenge to make some of these decisions. Um, but I think what's important as part of this is to get the structure that we may want to include this in there and we can agree to a certain project type that is that private development. Um, and it could be affordable. How it can be a variety of different things in that category um, that just shifts the methodology to the IFP slightly. Um, so I think that that is the important piece. Um, but I, I would, I think it would be really good to hear from Sonoma County tourism to directly to understand what it looks like um, that will be evolving probably on a regular basis. And then I think we'll be in a better situation to do the mathematical calculations behind the scenes to see the financial benefit. And we hope to secure Sonoma County tourism for the PFA meeting in April. That was our hope. I just, Carolyn? I'm sorry, just two more things on that. So just trying to understand, you know, what's the net positive impact, both to the county and to the city, of course. Um, and then... Uh, just, I, I think I'll just, I'll leave it at that. Well, actually the second thing, and maybe it's just helping me understand. So once the EFID is established and um, you know, the list has been created, even with these sorts of options, um, does the county board and the city have to annually review or vote? Um, so my question really is by adding sort of a priority one and a priority two, are you injecting a uh, political process in the, the delivery of the projects that wouldn't otherwise exist? And I think the answer is that yes, you are. Yes. And, and Chris, um, can you possibly give a little more insight on that? I know we've talked about that a few times over the last few weeks. Well, I think what, what we talked about was the possibility of moving from one priority, one project list to a priority two project list. I do think we want to, if possible, avoid the annual uh, supervision by the legislative bodies of the city and county once the priority list has been established. Um, and so I would, usually the way I think this would work is your PFA describes, uh, sorry, your IFP describes the specific facilities to be financed. And uh, and and then uh, the, the IFP would move, the PFA would move forward based on that IFP. If you're Shifting from priority one to priority two, I think it makes sense to tie that to legislative body approval. But once that's happened, I would think implementation would rest with the PFA. Anything else, Carolyn? Oh, stop there. Okay, thank you. I'm just wondering, I didn't hear an answer to Supervisor Rabbit's question about the ownership of the conference center. I think the one of the challenges is we don't know at this point. Um, as Sonoma County tourism evolves, if it's built on the Simon site, that site is privately owned and controlled. 
Um, would it be a sale of that property? Who would be the sale? Who would it go to? Uh, so all it's the very initial stages of that. Um, and I don't think that those details have been flushed out publicly yet. So private ownership is a, is a potential? It is a potential. I would say conference centers generally aren't that uh, because a conference center on its own is not a high revenue generator. And that's usually why you see it with hotels and other uses. It's added on to that and it drives the hotels. Um, but it's possible. Um, nonprofits, private, uh, local jurisdictions sometimes control them. So there's a few different options. Yes. Okay. Right. So if uh, we're waiting for the feasibility study, would we wait until the conclusion of it before we got started? Or did we, let's say that something happens during the course of it and we're alerted? Uh, we're not locked in, right? we're not gonna make a decision until after that's done or is the expectation is we're going to make a decision while things are still fluid and the study's being conducted. Well, what we can do, and I have a few uh, slides in the future here that look at the timeline and we'll talk about how this potentially affects that. Uh, because I think one of the challenges is we have these moving parts and we need to see these evolve to make this decision on the benefit because we're specifically calling out a conference center in the EIFD. Um, which would naturally tie it to the timelines for the conference center. Um, and we'd have to make a decision at some point through that. Um, but I'll, I'll talk through that in the next few slides so we can see what that actually means and how impactful that potentially is to the process. So I, I have a, a question and a, some information as a whole for the PFA and also uh, um, um, an observation. Um, the question is, when we look at item three, activation and beautification of existing right-of-way, uh, I may have missed it, Gabe, but are we making reference here to the key 4th Street Mendocino Avenue and related existing corridors? Yes. Okay, because that came up in discussion last time. Well, I wanted to be sure of that. Now, informationally, uh, in terms of the uh, potential conference center, just some additional information. Um, a working group that includes a metro chamber um, and... Um, and uh, Sonoma County Tourism, uh, which I'm in, involved in, and of course the city is involved in as well, uh, is also evaluating an alternative site, which the PFA should be aware of. Uh, not as good probably as the Sears site, but there are issues about the Sears site, which I can describe because I have fairly intimate knowledge of where that stands and where SCT is because I'm part of the working group that SCT is involved in. Um, that alternative site is the vacant cinema site and the vacant Bank America site, um, just uh, a block from here. Um, and a due diligence study is being financed uh, in order to evaluate, uh, evaluate that. Uh, and that's well along. Um, whether that is feasible or not remains to be seen, but it has a timeline probably much somewhat quicker than SCTs uh, on the, uh, on the uh, SEER side. Again, SCT is involved in these other discussions. There's not two competing approaches here. There's just the first one and then an alternative because the conference center in the downtown core obviously has benefits. Uh, in terms of the informational uh, aspect, um, it is extremely unusual for private ownership of, of a conference center in part because public ownership avoids uh, uh, property tax as part of the operating costs. And uh, in other states, you sometimes have a possessory interest on the part of private leaseholders who come in. Um, but in California, the value of that, that interest, as county folks are well aware, is taxed uh, on the property tax side. And so that uh, mitigates or reduces the, the value of a property tax reduction. Um, so that is uh, the common thing that, that typically happens. And most and often uh, municipalities, but also joint powers, uh, uh, organizations, city, county, and special districts are the ones that may, may, may own that, and that's very typical. Um, in terms of uh, what SCT is up to, yes, indeed, they have been in conversations with Simon Properties for, for some time. Uh, Simon has asked them to do so-called fit studies to determine if what SCT has in mind can actually fit on the site. And those FIT studies uh, are well along the way. SCT has engaged an architectural firm to do, to do that work. Uh, SCT also engaged HVS, the large uh, uh, national hospitality and, uh, and uh, 
development advisors to do a feasibility study of which uh, an initial first phase draft was released a couple of months ago. That study determined that there was an that there was in fact demand for a large scale conference and convention center uh, with, within Sonoma County. It determined that the best location was on the Sears site or potentially elsewhere in downtown. And it laid out various programmatic objectives, which included a 60,000 square foot center um, and a ballroom uh, and a hot associated hotel, which is, which is very common. Because conference centers uh, need hotel rooms and additional hotel rooms need conference centers, basically. So there's a synergistic relationship that's that's important. And of course, the hotel component would always pay 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 uh, pay property tax. Simon is in active negotiation with a national corporate housing developer on the Sears site. They are deep down the road, and in fact, they have shown uh, Simon has on their website what something like that might look like. That agreement is not signed. No one knows for sure if it will ever be signed, but all indications are it's likely to be signed. So there are concerns, and SUT shares them, uh, that uh, that the SEER site may prove not available to this effort. And that, that needs to be, I think, understood. If it does become available because of the massive amount of parking at the mall, it is a highly favorable location for a convention center. Uh, whether the alternative site, which can take another 60, a similar size facility, just two blocks away, can meet the parking needs is, a, is an open, open question that hasn't been determined yet. So that's all by way of background in this really important effort. In the next month or six weeks, a second phase study by HVS, which will include a fiscal analysis of what the cost might be and what some of the conventional sources for paying for those for that facility may be. And by the way, Gabe, none of this is to preempt at all SCT coming at the next meeting. I'm just giving you a forecast of where they stand right now. A month from now, probably a lot more would, would be known. So uh, I'll stop there and, and move on to, I, I guess what I would say are observations or concerns. Um, you can ask you just to follow up real quick. Of course. The uh, FIT studies, does that include um, setting aside land for the hotel and uh, yes. each site? Yes, there's really two sites on Sears. One is the Sears site and then the Sears Auto site, mm -hmm. which is basically a joint. And I'm just curious because I've heard different numbers. Uh, what size hotel are we talking about affiliated with the ballroom? You know how many rooms? I think 250. I'm, I'm not I'm not quite sure though, but I think. Thank you. And just one other question. Um, Councilman Rogers mentioned a site outside of the EIFD boundaries. Is that the fairgrounds? Yep. Mm -hmm. Just want to make sure we're all in the same page. Yep. The fairgrounds was evaluated by by the study and was was not as highly rated as a downtown site in large measure because of the walkability connections to a, to a downtown versus a fairgrounds location. Um, in terms of what you, you're really laying in, in, in front of us, Gabe, I, I have to say that I, my initial response is great concern about this priority structure for several reasons. One is conference centers are often financed through other sources of which versions of additional hotel taxes are most often the most typical means. Monterey, for example, financed $68 million expansion of the Monterey Conference Center, largely through a special hotel assessment district in which the closer the hotels were to the center, the more they paid. And that generated enough money as long-term stream of income to provide the basis for bond financing for, for that center. Whether that would completely pay for this or not, I don't know. But personally, I hate to see the IFD dollars get so heavily centered in a project which has another typical and conventional financing source, particularly when the conference center will generate sales tax for sure. It'll generate TOT dollars for sure. But the amount of tax increment dollars it will generate will be really quite de minimis because, as you pointed out, it really doesn't generate much in the way of, of housing demand. Um, 
so that's that's part of the concern I have about it. Um, the community as a whole, when they look at these dollars, will they really view uh, a, a conference center as fundamental as opposed to a major infrastructure and beautification impact that radiates through downtown, triggers public investment, and helps make Santa Rosa clearly the center of the community and indeed, and indeed the county. Just speaking as a, as a housing developer, if, you, if we want tax increment producing investment in the downtown core, the physical infrastructure throughout the downtown, in my opinion, should be the fundamental goal. And connectivity, for example, is interesting and potentially important, uh, but, and maybe some money should go to it, but a huge connectivity project will absolutely also suck up the dollars from the CIFD completely. Um, so I think we need to be cautious about the connectivity elements of this. And I do believe it's perfectly reasonable that the EIFD would have a role in a conference center uh, development, uh, but to basically allocate almost everything there uh, into it, uh, I think would be a serious error. Um, Vice Chair. For sure. Uh, to that point, uh, I believe that the, the purpose, and correct me if I'm wrong, Gabe, of this slide uh, was simply to generate conversation mm -hmm. and that the priority one list uh, can change depending on how this conversation flows, depending on what the interests are. So what that possibly means is instead of allocating 45 million to a conference center, right, you adjust that number. Maybe you pull affordable housing up to priority one as well um, and you figure out what those allocations are. And so, again, just for clarity, right, we are not suggesting that this is the final list mm -hmm. and that you all absolutely will inform what this list ultimately looks like. What we're trying to get to, though, is we need to decide on what this list looks like to finalize the IFP, at least in draft form. Well, I appreciate that clarification. So, so just speaking, just obviously, just one of, of the seven of us up here is I'm most comfortable with a single priority list as opposed to one that elevates EIFD to a dominant uh, position uh, for the reasons I've described. But that's just one opinion. Thank you. Um, I want to go back to talking about the uh, April 30th workshop because, you know, no matter what the public thinks about this, if the majority of the Board of Supervisors isn't, doesn't have buy-in, there's going to be, a, you know, the whole, the, the dollars are going to be a whole different amount. Um, and I think it's, it's more important, I believe, to talk about um, how we're going to increase the tax base than what actually gets built with, with this money. Um, and that's thinking about the audience of the of this Board of Supervisors. A whole different thing when you were talking about, about it to the general public. But um, first of all, you got to convince three out of five. Several years ago, Gabe, we had, we were using a, a, um, a study from R3 or 3R or something. Urban 3. Urban 3, yeah. thank you. That, you know, had, uh, Charts showing the, the value, tax value per acre, downtown, mall, all that type of thing. I think that I would like to see a presentation along those lines of, of how this increases the tax base, increases revenue for the city and the county. Um, and that's where I would start with this instead of starting with projects. Okay, thank you for the feedback. Mm -hmm. Any other questions, observations, or, or, or input, really, which is what you're really looking for, I think, at this stage? Correct. Yes. Just Karen. to come in, I understand how um, identifying specific projects helps, you know, focus us in, but I'm wondering if, if maybe a, sort of another approach is to look at categories. And, you know, so affordable housing, and then to think about in terms of percentages. So, you know, affordable housing, maybe it's bumped up to 20%. And I, what I'm doing sort of mentally is I'm going back to uh, one of our first meetings, we talked about criteria and, um, you know, I think you touched on it, but sort of the significance of projects, the um, ability to leverage, 
the overall economic impact downtown, and then that we sort of said no supplantation. That's, that's my crib sheet mentally. <laughs> I don't know how accurate it is, but so anyhow, just thinking about maybe it's you know looking at uh, percentages affordable housing maybe twenty percent, you know connectivity twenty percent, beautification you know slash climate related twenty percent, and then like a major economic impact or infrastructure project picks up the the forty. So looking at percentage approach that gives some flexibility within, you know, as opposed to necessarily, um, you know, putting everything all into one bucket, one priority or, you know, either or. I, I share his concern about the split priorities and particularly just from a political standpoint. Yeah. Anyway, one thought. I'm just saying, I think that's an excellent point. We did present in the last meetings a variety of different IFP project lists. Yeah. They go to very, very specific to very, very general. general. And they can program that way in general categories. And if we start with the types of projects that I think are the catalysts that increase that tax value and build them into more general lists, mm -hmm. then, then you're really empowering the PFA to work that expenditure. There aren't any decisions and you're dealing with the singular list. Mm -hmm. um, but that is definitely an option under the IFP. Mm -hmm. So if there was any members of the public here at this stage, they could talk, but I don't see anybody. Um, anything else from your end on, on this game? Uh, we have a few more slides here to go through. Oh, just please. Uh, so uh, this is just a quick reminder of process. Uh, so where we are right now, once we finalize the IFP, that IFP must be posted 10 days prior to our formal IFP introduction meeting. So once we figure out the direction, uh, and hopefully when we get that feedback on the 30th, and if it's moving forward, DTA will have a bit of work to finalize the documents. We'll post the documents 10 days prior to, and we'll understand where that meeting date actually fits. And then once that occurs, uh, the meetings start going on a 30-day frequency, but they can be more. So you have to have at least 30 days between the public hearing meetings. Uh, so depending on what the overall timeline looks like, and that'll be the last discussion here, uh, those could change the meeting frequency as well. Obviously, if we're, you know, we're not always 30 days, if we stick with every the third Thursday of every week. Uh, so we'll work that through. The first meeting is really just to hear comments. Um, the second public hearing is to provide those comments back into the IFP process and amend. Uh, but then you go back to the Board of Supervisors and the Council in that next step. So at that point, there's resolutions to either approve or deny um, the IFP through both bodies. And then it comes back to the PFA for that third public hearing. Um, and that third public hearing uh, is really the formation documents for the IFP. And based on when that third public meeting occurs, we'll set the base tax year. That, that's the critical component. Uh, we have to go to the Board of Equalization towards it's really a November 30th deadline at the back end of the year for the actual formation of the district. Um, but where we are right now, uh, we've been striving to meet the 23-24 base year. Uh, it's going to be very challenging uh, because of how the taxes work. Uh, so really the way this process works is it does go year to year. Um, obviously there's an interest on our end to move it forward, understanding that there are certain conversations that may need to commence on that project side, uh, respecting the fact that the, the board of supervisors needs to make their final determination about this. Um, we really could push this one all the way to December and you really could push it into calendar 20 year 2025 if we needed to. So just sketching this out, if we went with a fairly, what I think would be an aggressive timeline, but would create a bit of space. Um, if feedback is provided and we can go into an introduction meeting, we can still hopefully have the meeting with um, Sonoma County Tourism on April. But if we can go into an introduction meeting towards the end of May for the IFP, where that puts us is a public hearing generally June or July, uh, the second public hearing in August, where we're going to the Board of Supervisors or the City Council in September, October. And then that gets us really to the final PFA, really probably around that same time, more October, November. Um, some of these can run on a parallel track. Um, the Board of Equalization would then be November 30th. That would button it up in this calendar year. Um, if it pushes into next, what still is happening is you're staying in the 24-25 pace year. Um, because of how the fiscal year works. So really it can run all the way up until essentially August of next year and still stay in the 24, 25 base year. 
Um, obviously, that's a pretty significant investment in time, and we want to be sensitive to resources. So our, our goal is to try to truncate that down a little bit, um, but those are the legal parameters around it. Um, so I just wanted to make sure that that was clear through the process and happy to answer any questions on the timeline. Gabe, when do you need a decision from the Board of Supervisors on the amount of the income? So that would be prior to us producing the draft IFP. So if the Board of Supervisors can make a determination, we can work that in. Um, and Lenny, I believe you're still on. So can you give us a rough timeline of if once we get the tax commitments, how much time is on your end to finalize the IFP? Yes, yeah, so it would probably take us about three to four weeks um, after we can finalize the numbers. Since all of the data is in there, we, again, the, the most majority of that process will just be coordinating with Chris and Bob um, for their review and they are timely. So um, I, I anticipate it being a month from the time that we can get the numbers. Could you translate that on, on the timeline into the, the preferred date and the, um, the, the last possible date in, the, in that? Timeline. Yeah, so what would be great is that if we had an answer by the 30th, but I understand the format of the meeting by 30th, April 30th. Yeah, yeah. I don't so, think that's set up for a decision point, is it? If we're calling out a workshop. It's not currently. Mm -hmm. Is it possible to do that? I think so. We'll just have to notice it that way. We have the chair of the board down there, so I, I, I don't want to, I want to be, uh, uh, in the wrong place here. No, I, no, I appreciate that. And, uh, do we know if uh, Eric Shop has been shuffling through numbers to, to be able to provide content for us at that meeting? I don't know. I can find out, but I don't have that answer right now. So hypothetically, um, the second supervisor meeting in May I don't think significantly impacts the timeline that you just laid out. It, it really doesn't. So that would likely be that if we get a decision for the second meeting in May, we're likely producing, and we may have to move that meeting to the back end of June. So we would basically do the intro meeting. And then really what we're doing is sort of pushing probably past the calendar year and in, into January potentially. I want to make sure that there's enough space to coordinate all of the meetings between the public hearings. And I want to be so respectful of the fact that not everybody's always to, able to meet on that 30 day regimented schedule. Um, so what that really does is it still locks us into that base year. The board of the equalization process just kicks into the next year. So really, as we move any of that out past April, we're really moving our end date the same amount of months. It's maybe the easiest way to look at it. Okay. And I, I want to be realistic about it. Second meeting in May, maybe two weeks after the workshop, that may not be enough time for staff to put together the, the agenda item. And just saying. Anything else good? Uh, that concludes our presentation. Okay. Any final observations, comments, requests for information? Uh, if not, on to item five, discussion of next meeting agenda, which we've kind of been doing, but go ahead, Gabe. So really, I think the sole focus, if we can coordinate it, is to have that discussion about the conference center. Um, uh, what we'll do, I, I think at this point, uh, obviously, as we go through the, the meeting on the 30th becomes critical as far as the conversation with four supervisors, that meeting in April will likely happen before. Uh, so I think that the sole focus of that next meeting on our end agenda wise would be if we can coordinate Sonoma County Tourism and the, to present their conference center proposal. M might I suggest that by that time, the alternative site, which Sonoma County Tourism is involved in too, but particularly led by the Metro Chamber with the city's involvement, might also be part of that presentation to give the full picture at yes. this time. Yeah. So just to clarify, is that meeting the... The 18th or the 20th? Let me check the calendar. 18th, 18th, correct. 18th. Just for the record, I will not be here. Okay. 
and we may, and as I mentioned, we'll try to work it out to the best of our ability with some county tourism. Um, we can move that meeting around potentially to meet schedules, but that would be our next schedule. Any other comments about the next meeting agenda or requests for items? Not unless I'm mistaken or adjourned. Thanks, everybody. Mm -hmm.